Welcome everyone to our first installment of the What's Good series. In this series, we'll be taking a look at all of the various inks in Lorcana, and today, let's discuss what's good with Amber. Now, whether you agree or disagree with my lovely takes, let us know in the comments, please. Now, each ink in Lorcana comes with its own flavor. Ravensburger has described Amber Glimmers as purposeful. Patient and dedicated, they're able to pursue causes and ambitions with single-minded persistence. They often work within communities, either from above, as a leader, or from within, as a healer, bodyguard, or just a loyal follower. We can see this flavor represented in the card mechanics and the various packages within Amber, and none is more obvious than the healing package. Now, healing in Lorcana is a bit interesting. You won't often have a situation where your opponent has damaged your character and it has survived to make it to your turn outside of a few global damage abilities. It's most often used when you challenge an opposing character and survive to then make it more difficult for your opponent to remove that character, often preventing the option entirely or forcing them to commit more resources to do so. Keep that in mind as we discuss these next couple of cards. Healing Glow and Hakuna Matata are both cards that we'll rarely see play until we see on healing triggers in the game. There are simply better options for Healing Glow that we'll discuss later, and a board state where Hakuna Matata is valuable are simply few and far between. Dingle Hopper is at least a reusable item that can gain value throughout the game. Uh, I've had it come in clutch in some starter deck events, but it's still not particularly great. Now, it may sound like I'm hating on healing here, but that's largely because not only are there better options in Sapphire, but because our final Amber healing card blows the rest out of the water. Rapunzel is a top tier card as not only does she offer the tempo advantages of healing, but also provides card draw on a decent body for her cost. I honestly find it hard to imagine any Amber deck not running her as a four of. Next up, we have the protection package, or as the lore described, bodyguards. Before I jump into the bodyguards themselves, though, I want to talk about Amber's combat tricks. So first up here in the middle are Control Your Temper and Maximus, which has the same ability on a decent body. These are why I said that Healing Glow is currently outclassed. They reduce an opposing character's strength by two, which would prevent the two damage that Healing Glow would heal, but has extra utility such as allowing a character to survive a challenge when it otherwise wouldn't and wouldn't be healable, or allow you to prevent multiple instances of damage if you challenge into that same character with multiple of your characters. This little trick can easily skew the math in your favor and take your opponent by surprise. Next up, we have Prince Philip, who is the closest thing to removal that Amber possesses. When he challenges something and is banished, the other character is banished alongside him. So, he protects your characters by valiantly charging into a scary opponent, like, say, a Maleficent Dragon, and sacrificing himself to remove the threat to your other characters. Because of how slow he is and his inkless status, he hasn't seen much play yet, but that may change. Then, we have the bodyguards. Simba is a premier card. He's overvalued for his cost, as he has the stats of a vanilla with bodyguard thrown in. He's amazing in aggro decks for protecting your weak, high lore value characters, or even late game to force your opponent to commit resources to remove him before dealing with your late game threats. Goofy, on the other hand, while being a nice, chonky bodyguard, loses some value because the Musketeers keyword doesn't quite have enough going for it to really build around yet. But I can't wait till I can get a viable Musketeers deck running in a set or two. 
Finally, we have Maximus and Hey Hey, who I've saved for last because they share the support keyword. Allows them to add their strength to another character when they quest. Support's an amazing value ability as it almost lets your character quest and challenge in the same activation. Hey Hey is great because as a one cost, it's simply very cheap and often one damage can be the breakpoint between a successful challenge or not. Maximus takes it up to another level by also having Bodyguard. So not only can he quest gaining you a lore, but then adds his four strength to another character and protects the rest of your board the following turn. I absolutely love this card simply because of the amount of value he provides. He's top tier in one of my decks right now. Now we have the princess package or royalty in the lore. Now, there are a handful of princesses in amber, as well as a few other colors, primarily sapphire, and building a princess-themed deck is very viable. In amber, we have the singer Ariel, which we'll discuss later, the two vanilla princesses in human Ariel and Minnie Mouse, Cinderella, who is a singer 5 and can heal other princesses by exerting, and the Rapunzel that we talked about earlier. The real star of the show, though, the one who makes princess matters, well, matter, is Moana. Not only is she a 5 cost 3 lore character, which is incredibly valuable on its own, but her ability allows you to ready your other princesses after she quests. But then princesses can no longer quest for the turn. This allows you to basically double your action economy, allowing you to quest, challenge, or sing with your princesses, and then ready again to challenge and sing again. Or simply leave them readied so that they can't be challenged by your opponent and you can gain their lore value all over again next turn. This really provides so much value, but there are a few caveats. The ready is all or nothing, and once Moana quests, no other princesses can quest, whether they were readied by her ability or not. Meaning proper sequencing is going to be important, and no double Moana quest and ready shenanigans. Sorry. Next up is the Stitch, or Community Package. I hope this doesn't awaken anything in any of you. This package revolves around Rockstar Stitch, whose ability states that when you play a cost 2 or less character, you may exert it to draw a card. He can also shift onto Baby Stitch for 4. Now, entire decks have spawned around him that focus on flooding the board with cheap characters and simply overwhelming your opponent through card advantage. The amber cards that support this playstyle are Lilo, who is an amazing lore generator and can cause massive headaches for your opponent if followed by Simba, Hey Hey, who we discussed earlier, and Timon isn't even worth discussing, in my opinion. Now, that leaves Lufu, who is a good lore generator as well, and can combo with Gaston in Ruby that is also a 2 cost. Finally, we have Sebastian, who Singer 4 isn't particularly valuable with the current songs in the game, but may see some more value later on. Similarly, Surfer Stitch wants to see a bunch of characters on the board, as if you have two or more in play when he's played, you draw two cards. Nice little value right there. Last up, before miscellaneous cards, is what I'm dubbing the value package. On the left, we have our singer package, led by Ariel, who's not only a three cost with singer five, allowing her to sing five cost songs, which are very valuable so far, but also allows you to search the top four cards of your deck for a song and place it into your hand, not only potentially replacing herself, but also setting you up with one of those clutch songs. Similarly, Be Our Guest is a song that lets you search the top four for a character, letting you search for that clutch character you need and potentially replacing itself as well. And Ursula's Necklace that lets you pay one ink to draw when you sing a card, adding even more value to singing. Then we have our ramp package in Lantern and Just in Time, which both let you cheat out characters early. Lantern is a bit more consistent value, 
But there are some very strong combos with just in time, like dropping a Cusco turn 3. Finally, we have the recursion package of Hades and part of your world that can bring characters from your discard back to your hand. Now this isn't nearly as good as bringing them back into play, and they are inkless, but being able to return a clutch character back to your hand can be nice. Hades is on a body, but part of your world is a song, so they can find themselves in different decks if you find this ability valuable. Finally, we have the miscellaneous cards that don't really fit in anywhere else. First, we have the various Manila cards without relevant costs or keywords. Pumba is pretty meh. Uh, I'd at least rather have Mr. Smee over him just because of the cheaper cost. And Mickey is a good quester at least. Now, You've Forgotten Me is an amazing card. It's really weird that the best Emerald card is in Amber, but I won't complain. Being able to force your opponent to discard two cards for the cost of one of yours can be very valuable. Then we have Hades. He's a very interesting card. Uh, that it, he's the top end of the Villain Matters deck. However, the only other villain in Amber is Baby Hades. Now, once we see more villains in Amber, I imagine this card will become much more valuable. But you can already build some really fun decks with him. I've had a lot of fun getting some OTKs uh, with this card. Well, that concludes this episode. Y'all know the deal. Like, subscribe, bell, and most definitely let me know what y'all think. What's good with Amber?